Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Nada Youssef, and you're listening to Health Essentials Podcast by Cleveland Clinic. Today, we're broadcasting from Cleveland Clinic main campus here in Cleveland, Ohio, and we're here with Dr. Pellin Batur. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. And Dr. Batur is a women's health specialist practicing in the Center for Specialized Women's Health and is an associate professor for OBGYN and reproductive biology. And today, we're here to talk about menopause. And please remember, this is for informational purposes only, and it's not intended to replace your own physician's advice. To kick off our discussion of the transition that is menopause, can you give us a quick recap of stages of menopause? Sure. Um, so the me menopause, by definition, is 12 months of no periods. Um, and that's really the only way we can truly um, diagnose menopause. Um, now, menopause uh, starts with a menopause transition, and there's the early menopause transition where you might be having some screwed up cycles a little bit, or you might actually be having some symptoms like hot flashes, but for the most part, you're still having once regular, once a month regular periods. Late menopause transition is where you're really starting to skip months and months at a time, and we know, you know, sometime is around the corner, um, but really all these stages have different time spans for different people. People, and it's hard to make the diagnosis until you actually go through. So it's what we call a retrospective diagnosis. You look back, and over the last 12 months, I haven't had a bleed. So that's one of the main ways that we use to diagnose menopause. Now, people always ask about hormone testing. Um, and menopausal hormones can be helpful to aid in the diagnosis to figure out what's happening with the cycles, but it only gives us one snapshot in time. So again, you can go six months without a period, have hormonal blood tests that look like you're in menopause, but if you ovulate and have a period after, your clock starts back at zero. The first thing I think of when you say 12 months, no period, what about people that are on birth control that mm -hmm. maybe even stops it completely? How would they then know? Yeah, so this is a great question. And when you are on any kind of hormones that are affecting your cycles, you can't use that um, as a, you know, that. so it really is 12 months off of any hormones that can affect your cycles mm -hmm. and also in the absence of any medical conditions. So assuming that your thyroid isn't off, or that you don't have any other hormonal problems like a prolactinoma, which is a um, when elevated, uh, it's a brain hormone that when elevated um, can actually cause cessation of menses. So depending on what age you are when you're coming into our office, uh, we're usually going to look at uh, your medical health to make sure we're not missing something else that may be causing the lack of periods. And if, especially if you're younger, we do usually do some uh, blood testing to make sure we're barking up the right tree and not misdiagnosing you as menopausal. Great, thank you. So let's talk about perimenopause, what that is, and when is it normal for women to start going through it? So um, perimenopause, it can actually start, you know, a decade before where you're starting to get some hot flashes. And for most women, it isn't. It's usually within the few years prior to the last menstrual cycle. Um, but perimenopause is oftentimes a time of transition where women may experience screwed up menstrual cycles. And what's important to mention to your doctor? Well, um, I always say if you're skipping months and months at a time and, then the, you, and you're close to the age of menopause, which is about age 51, 52, um, and you're skipping months and months at a time, and the one you have after that is pretty normal, then you can just keep an eye on it. But what you do want to let your doctor know about is if you're skipping months and months at a time, and then the one you have after is really heavy, like your body's trying to compensate for that, or you're having a lot of spotting in between your cycles, or there's lots more cramping or blood clots, any of that, you really should talk to your doctor, make sure that you get a checkup. Great, thank you. So how do you diagnose menopause and should you get your hormones checked? Right, so um, women, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, most likely it's a duck. What do I mean by that? So if you're 51 and you've been skipping for the last two years and now you've stopped your cycles and you're having hot flashes and you haven't had a bleed for the last year, it's likely that you're in menopause. Um, now we still probably wanna check a thyroid and some basics to make sure that we're not missing anything else. Um, we're going to definitely look at your medical history, make sure you're not on any medications that might affect. Um, so in those women that where it's a little bit more of the typical story, you don't need tons of expensive lab tests. I mean, sometimes we do. There's always exceptions to the rule. Um, but usually we talk to you and we try to sort things out that way. 
It's a little different if you're coming in at a younger age. So early menopause is defined as between ages 40 and 45. Um, and then premature uh, menopause uh, is what we used to call it. Now we call it premature ovarian insufficiency or primary ovarian insufficiency, POI. That's looking like your menopausal before the age of 40. And those almost always we're going to do some investigation with some hormone testing to make sure we're not missing anything. Right, and so that is called premature menopause then? Is that so yeah, we've kind of moved away from the term premature menopause. So if you're less than age 40 and you're looking like you are menopausal, you haven't bled for many uh, months, um, it's really important to talk to your doctor because um, even if you've gone the whole 12 months and then it looks like you have the hormone testing that looks like you're in menopause, so that would be an elevated FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, the brain hormone that regulates the ovary, ovary uh, production um, of hormones, and also um, the low estradiol levels. So that's your estrogen, dominant estrogen. So if the estrogen is low and the FSH is real high and you're in your 30s and your 40s, um, we're going to really do some investigation. If it's before age 40 and you're looking like you're menopausal, we call that POI, you know, premature or primary ovarian insufficiency. Why the name change? Because we see many, many women that are diagnosed with premature menopause and we know 5 to 10% of these women can actually even become pregnant because they can still ovulate. They may ovulate and not bleed. Um, they may bleed and not ovulate. Um, so only way we'd know she's in menopause when she's younger is if she had her ovaries removed. If it's based on hormones, again, those hormones are telling us one snapshot in time, and hormones may change over time. So to allow for that f understanding of that flexibility, that's why we call it in ovarian insufficiency. Okay. So POI, not premature menopause. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, how can you tell if you've gone through menopause after a hysterectomy, and why do you need to know? Yeah, so that's a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and the same goes true if they've had an ablation, if a woman's had an ablation and she's no longer having cycles. Mm -hmm. um, so there, uh, depending on what are, where our goals are. So if you had a hysterectomy and you're at age 50, so it's probably not so critical that we do a bunch of hormone testing because it's really not going to change how we manage you. So if you're having terrible symptoms, we're going to talk to you about hormone therapy options um, and non-hormonal options. Um, but if you are, you know, 40 and you had a hysterectomy, then it does make a difference um, because we also want to know if you had your ovaries left in place and you had your uterus removed, you know, now you're not bleeding, but we don't know if when you're going through the transition. So not that you have to have your hormones checked every three to six months, right? That'd be very expensive, time consuming, and it's only giving us a snapshot in time. But we do want to have a rough idea of how much estrogen your body's producing, because I want to know, all right, when do I have to start worrying about osteoporosis, osteopenia, bone thinning? Um, if you are, you know, 42 and you've lost your hormones, then we know that there's a lot more medical risks to that woman, and oftentimes we will start hormone therapy until the natural age of menopause. So we want to know when we're going through menopause because there's a lot of risks and a lot of diseases that come after the fact mm -hmm. that we have to be in the lookout for. Especially with premature menopause, okay, or premature ovarian insufficiency. So what are some of the things that we worry about? Well, we worry about... Um, uh, increased elevated risks of cardiovascular disease, increased risks of stroke, increased risks of dementia, earlier bone aging. So if you go through menopause at age or you know premature ovarian insufficiency, you're 35, you have an additional 15 years of heart, bone aging, you know, um, brain aging, and not to mention other symptoms like uh, um, increased risk of anxiety and depression, um, increased arthritis risks. Even lung diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD risks, asthma risks are increased. So there's lots that comes with earlier cessation of menses, and it turns out that the use of hormone therapy in these women can help negate or minimize some of these risks. Excellent. Well, let's talk about just the symptoms of menopause. Mm -hmm. uh, what can most women expect? Well, it's hard to say most women. Um, it, this really, the experience is varied for every woman. So some women are lucky. They go through gracefully with very minimal symptoms and lucky for them, right? And there are other women, it, it's not so graceful. It's a little bit more clunky, where they may be experiencing lots of hot flashes or night sweats. And hot flashes are the sudden sensation of heat um, and may or may not be associated with flushing and sweating. And the night sweats can actually be very disruptive to the sleep cycle, where women feel like they can't get through the night, um, as well as the 
they could, as, as well as they usually could with sleeping. Um, vaginal dryness, the vagina is quite sensitive to the lack of estrogen, and about 50% of patients, so about a half of women, do get some vaginal dryness that may get in the way of intercourse, and that tends to get worse over time. So hot flashes and some of the other symptoms, within a decade, uh, many women find that they're actually feeling better, but the vaginal dryness type of symptoms do get worse and worse. So speak up and talk to your doctor about it if you're, you're not alone, and you know uh, there are multiple therapies that we can offer. Um, but we you know, also worry about mood changes, so. Now is depression a part of menopause? So it's interesting, so depression and anxiety seem to really be an issue during the menopause transition, the perimenopause period. Uh, so what we do know is that women who didn't even have a history of any kind of postpartum depression or hormonal sensitivity or PMS, PMDD type of symptoms, that actually they can develop new onset of um, anxiety and depression. For many women, that seems to get better after menopause. Um, but that is something that we should, women, again, should speak up about because it's happening to a lot more women than is really discussed. Mm -hmm. um, and other things like that are affected by hormones. So for example, menstrual migraines, women who suffer from a lot of uh, migraine headaches may see a worsening during the menopause transition. Many patients will get, see some relief luckily after menopause, but not necessarily. Yeah. So when you say menopause transition, how long are we talking, usually estimate? It really varies, yeah. okay? Um, so we were bad about quoting how long menopausal symptoms will even last. So we used to say about five years, and now it turns out menopausal symptoms after the final menstrual period, many women have seven, seven years to 12 years of symptoms, and some women still have problems into their 80s. So we're just now understanding even the basics about menopause, the menopause transition even le is less understood. Um, why does it happen? How long does it take? And realistically, lifestyle changes, uh, lifestyle factors likely have a role, genetics likely have a role, um, but it's not fully understood, and every woman's experience is a little different, but typically the few years leading up to the final period. So um, if I look at my mom, should I expect to have similar symptoms, similar uh, age when I go through menopause? Because I know everybody's different, but right. is mom a good one to look at? And I don't have a good scientific answer for that okay. because that's still being looked at in research. Um, and we know in some families there seems to be some similarity, but it's a lot more than just genetics. And remember, genetics is not just your mom, right? Genetics comes from, you know, Uncle Carl's side of the family and Aunt Molly, you know, so um, you, it's genetics is complex, plus how we live our life seems to have a role. Um, women, for example, with autoimmune conditions, so thyroid problems, rheumatoid arthritis, any of those inflammatory type of conditions are li like likely to have their menopause a little earlier. So a lot goes into it. And if I could predict when you're going to go through menopause, I would be retired on some Caribbean island. Um, but we really don't have that tool. Um, so no hormone test is going to tell you when you're going to go through menopause. It just tells us what your hormones are doing right now. So it really is a matter of talking to the patient and sorting things out. So let's talk about some of the physical changes. Um, I've heard that menopause can cause more growth of facial hair. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. So... Um, you know, when you lose estrogen after menopause, you start to um, you start to have a little bit more dominance of your testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do we associate with testosterone? Um, thinning hair, some increased hair growth on the chin, um, and yeah, that that can happen. And we have some women who actually opt for hormone therapy just because of their thinning hair, for example. Um, so that can happen, but there is a plus side to it. Women who go through menopause tend to have to shave their legs a lot less. Um, there's thinning of the hair down there. So the extra minute of plucking, you know, you save on the shaving, you know. <laughs> Very good. So um, does menopause really cause weight gain? Is it slowing down your metabolism? Sounds like everything's just declining. <laughs> no, and I wish I had some good news for that, but you know, I'm just to hop in a skip away from menopause myself, so I'm not looking forward to it. It's almost universal that women report weight gain. So it's not in your mind. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, nothing that's screwed up with you. That is something whether you're, you know, a size zero, a size five thousand, it really doesn't matter. Um, every woman comes in complaining about it. Um, and we don't really know why, so it probably is partly slowing of metabolism. It might be hormonal. The good news is that if you need to go on menopausal hormone therapy, it does not contribute to weight gain. But the bad news is all women going through menopause, whether they're going through it naturally or through um, 
with taking medications seem to experience some weight gain. In fact, studies that we do have suggest that menopausal hormones may be a little protective from that weight gain, um, but it's a time where we really have to watch. Make right. some changes. Sure. Yeah. Now, going back to hot flashes, I mm -hmm. know um, that's usually kind of seems like the most common symptom that you hear from women. Um, should Is this ever bad for your health? Should it be treated? Um, I mean, if it's messing with your sleep cycle, maybe, but is it something to look at and worry about? So um, two things before we go into that, I just wanted to also touch on a question I always get about the weight I forgot yes. to mention. Um, so it, the weight gain is a little bit more in the central region. And that's thinking of it like a testosterone effect, right? Where do men carry their weight? They carry it centrally. So that's also a common question that I want to make sure I'm addressing, that even if you might be the same weight, women are noticing it more around the waistline. Um, so, you know, minimizing sugars and really uh, upping your exercise can help with that. Um, now, as far as hot flashes, hot flashes, they're not dangerous on their own. Um, they're certainly a nuisance. Um, there are some data about whether women who hot flash more, are they more increase, at increased risk of cardiovascular disease? But on its own, hot flashes don't indicate an, a heart problem or anything like that. Um, do they need to be treated? This is where we actually talk to the woman and see um, what she's thinking. If it's, you know, if you're having one or two hot flashes a day and you dress in layers and you can get through it just fine, no big deal, right? But if you are, you know, plagued with them, you can't sit through a meeting at work, you're constantly flushing and sweating, you're not getting through your nighttime with your sleep because of night sweats, then it really becomes a quality of life issue, a nuisance. Do you have any tips for dealing with hot flashes? Yeah, um, so when we, I, I think of it in a three-pronged approach. You know, the uh, natural approaches, um, medicine approaches that are non-hormonal and hormonal approaches. Um, clearly, our hormonal approaches are the most effective, okay? Um, but I always encourage women to start with non-hormonal, uh, just the, some of the holistic approaches. And what are they? You know, dressing in layers. Um, so there are some data that uh, increased intake of sugar, stress, caffeine may be contributors. The data for all of this is very weak, um, but certainly it makes sense to try to minimize your stress, uh, you know, my, practice mindfulness, do some deep breathing. Um, uh, there are lots of products over the counter that are touted as aids. Um, you do want to exercise a little bit of caution when reaching for them. Most of them, if we look at our well-designed studies, don't show much benefit over placebo. Uh, placebo being like, I give you a Tic Tac and say this is a medication that's going to really help you. About 30% of the time, somebody is going to feel the benefits. And it's not because anybody thinks you're crazy. It's because, you know, mind over matter. And we do know that um, cognitive behavioral therapies where you focus on your thoughts about hot flashes, those have been shown to be helpful, um, actually, in well-designed studies. Um, so, you know, when you're reaching for something over the counter, if it's reasonably safe, I'm not too worried about it. But sometimes I worry about the safety and purity of the products that we have in the United States. So you have to choose your products carefully. Um, so I would encourage people to check out our Cleveland Clinic website. We have a pretty uh, rich menopause section. Uh, I've been working on updating those handouts over the last six years and really making sure that um, I've written most of them, actually. Um, so if you go, if you Google or, you know, go into Bing or whatever's your search engine and put in Cleveland Clinic, non-hormonal ways to combat hot flashes, you should pull it up. If you go to clevelandclinic.org and hit that search button, that should be pulling it up too. Um, and it kind of goes through all the different products that are available. We talk about diet, for example, soy products. It lists different types of foods and how much soy uh, that's plant-based estrogen uh, it has in them. So if you're getting it through your diet, that's okay, like flaxseed and soy and tofu. Now, when you start to get into man-made products, the phytoestrogens, as they say, the plant-based estrogens, you are essentially have an unregulated... Um, it's an unregulated field, right? So you have a business person putting together a... Um, plant estrogen, sometimes in powerful form. And we just don't know, we don't have good long-term data for how that affects us. We don't have good long-term data for effect of breast safety. Because plant estrogens are found in nature, but they're actually unnatural to our body chemistry, so it doesn't look like our own estrogen. So when you're putting it into man-made forms, then you're starting to get into, you know, essentially a chemical that you're putting into your body. But if you're doing it naturally through foods, that's safe. So are these uh, are these supplements that you're talking about, mm -hmm. or is it kind of like uh, 
preservatives and food or? No, supplements. Okay, so supplements. if you go to your typical um, health food store, you'll find tons of supplements. And some women, we do know many women try them, and, and it's okay. Um, Long-term safety, we don't know. Black cohosh, for example, there are some concerns. That's a supplement over the counter. There are some concerns about liver safety. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been reports of liver failure. Um, so the FDA has cautioned about no more than six months of use for that. So just because you're getting it at the health food store doesn't necessarily mean it's safer. Right. Um, and you you have to be careful. There are lots of estrogen and progestin creams, that especially if you have your survived breast cancer, for example, I would discourage you from using those because you do absorb estrogen through creams very readily, um, but you don't absorb progesterone uh, through your skin easily. And so we do see a lot of women who have been lathering on a lot of estrogen products and lathering on some progesterone thinking they're balancing and they're not and we've seen problems with uterine cancer and precancer with that yeah so for the over-the-counter uh, medications that some of them you'd have to be kind of use with caution some mm -hmm. of them are safe how can we tell what's okay to use and what's not to use are there ingredients we should be looking for anything like that yeah so there are some studies uh, looking at some uh, uh, plant-based estrogens coming out of Japan and Europe where there's actually some benefit over placebo but when you look at the data overall there's really not much benefit over placebo with most of these products so I hate in my practice to encourage use of something that actually is quite pricey where I don't know the long-term safety and the suspicion for whether it's really going to help or not. Um, but I think if you want to try something on your own for a month or two and, you know, see if it helps you, I think that's okay. But I don't think it's something to be using for five, six years for your main treatment of menopausal symptoms. So that's the first branch. Um, there's also, you know, hypnosis and acupuncture. So there's some data for hypnosis. And again, cognitive behavioral therapy. Data for acupuncture has been very mixed. Um, so most studies suggest not much benefit over sham procedures. But frankly, I, I, I like, you know, hyp hypnotherapy and acupuncture. I do think it helps a lot of women. So um, if they want to do that, I have no objections. I, I think the safety profile is just fine. Um, it's just a cost, you know, it's a time and cost investment for many women. So I hate to feel them towards products that are going to be questionable or not going to help so much, especially if they're paying a lot of money out of pocket. We also have the second option, right, the non-hormonal option. So we have several medications that are, and that's all listed in that um, non-hormonal ways to combat hot flashes insert, or the, not insert, um, the patient education materials I recommended um, that lists all the different types of products out there that we do use. These are FDA-approved medications, um, but they're FDA-approved for other reasons, but they also happen to work with for hot flashes. And we do have good data that they work better than placebo. And so we've listed all the ones where they've actually been shown to be beneficial. Um, the SSRIs and SNRIs, these are a group of antidepressants uh, that have been shown to be beneficial. And in fact, these are some of our go-tos for women for example, our breast cancer survivors who sometimes have the worst symptoms. Um, and in those women, obviously, we can't easily use hormonal options. So we, these are some of our go-to medications, and they can help. You know, so if when um, women come in and we offer them, some women come back and they say, oh, my gosh, you should offer this to everybody. It helped me with so many of my symptoms. And we say, we do, but not every woman takes us up on it. And everybody's results do vary. Um, but And then there's also anti-seizure medication called gabapentin. It can help with sleep and with hot flashes, and they come with a, their different array of pros and cons with their side effects that we have to talk out. So we usually review all these options with women and whatever she feels the most comfortable with, recognizing that you can always try one and if it didn't work well for you, it's not like once you walk through the store, you can never walk back, you're not gonna do any irreparable damage. If it doesn't work for you, we can try something different. If we have any of our viewers or listening listeners listening and um, you know you just said the hypnosis the acupuncture if they do want to try something like that do we offer that here at Cleveland Clinic do they go through you how we do okay. and so they can ask their primary care doctor or their gynecologist to get them pointed in the right direction um, but if you uh, if you want to, if, what the science shows us now if you want to pin me down for what's most likely to help I would say cognitive behavioral therapy um, I would say uh, hypnotherapy um, and then a shout out for acupuncture, which may help, especially if you have other things like migraines or aches and pains, they can work on more than one thing. And then the non-hormonal uh, medication options for women who don't are absolutely said they don't want to do hormones. Um, but the prescription options are going to be the most effective. And speaking of hormones, mm -hmm. what is the latest on hormone uh, replacement therapy? And how does a woman decide if we should do it? 
Right. So this is where I'd like to really spend some time on, sure. um, because hormone therapy is a very confusing field, the risks and benefits. That's why it is important to make sure that the doctor that you're seeing feels comfortable with them. Uh, in fact, many of us are certified in menopausal medicine by the North American Menopause Society. So if you go to their website, it'll give you a list of um, people in your town uh, who are certified, because it really gets very confusing, the data. Um, so there's something called the timing hypothesis that says that depending on how old you are, when you start menopause, when you start um, hormone therapy, your risks and benefits are going to be vastly different. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? So most of the package in certain hormone therapy and why people are afraid of it, it literally looks like we're trying to kill you. It's gonna, it tells you we're going to give you breast cancer and a heart attack. You know? And the reality is the, there are some risks that we can talk about, but the, this package insert is written for women who are, who've cleared menopause for 10, 15 years. They're now in their mid 60s and 70s, and they're deciding to whether they want to go on hormone therapy to prevent disease. And that's not the typical situation. The typical situation that we're seeing in the office is somebody who's newly menopausal. She's typically late 40s, early 50s, and she's having terrible symptoms. It turns out the risks and the benefits for that woman, for the woman in her 50s, is much, much more favorable as opposed to a woman who is in her 60s and 70s who's deciding to start hormone therapy now. And taking this timing hypothesis a little further, if you go to women who are prematurely um, losing their ovarian function, so the, the POI like before age 40, the early menopause between age 40 to 45, in these women, we typically start, unless there's a reason not to, we typically start hormone therapy to minimize the risks of all those things that you're gonna read about in the package insert, okay? And so almost all of the menopause and endocrine me medical societies do recommend in those situations when you're in earlier menopause, a POI, to actually start hormone therapy and continue it as long as it's you're medically fit to do so until the natural age of menopause, which is you know, 50 to 51 to 52. So it's safe because you do hear a lot of things about mm -hmm. it. It seems very controversial, but it is safe. And if you're, you said over the age of 65 or 66, no longer menopausal, that's when, it, that's when the side effects could harm us. So there's no woman where we say, absolutely, you can't be on hormone therapy, okay? It's all about balancing risks and benefits. So for the average patient who is gonna choose to drive to the doctor's appointment, they took on their greatest risk of death, right, by choosing to drive. So the pros and cons to driving, right? I mean, you can choose not to drive and negate that risk of having serious injury, but you'd probably be stuck at home feeling depressed. You're not going to get good nutrition, you know? So there's a pro and a con to everything, and it's the same discussion with the hormone therapy. So there are risks and there are benefits. So the risks and benefits are very, seem to be very different depending on not just your age, but whether you need the estrogen plus progestin or estrogen alone. So we, the only time we really are using progestin is if a woman has a uterus. Because if that woman has a uterus, we can't just use estrogen alone. We will increase her risk of uterine cancer. If we add the progestin, we're not going to increase her risk of uterine cancer. But if a woman has had a hysterectomy, then she only needs estrogen. And it turns out the progesterone steals a little bit from some of the benefits of the estrogen. So some of the cardiovascular benefits on the arteries, um, the cholesterol benefits, and then, you know, breast cancer risk is not significantly increased in estrogen-only users. In fact, there's no increased risk in estrogen until maybe 15, 20 years of use with estrogen. And women in their 50s um, who were using estrogen had actually less breast cancer when they took estrogen alone. So it te seems to be the progesterone or the progestin that is the culprit for that. Um, so there are... The breast cancer risks is the biggest thing I think that women worry about. And if you're taking estrogen alone, you really have plenty of time to not worry about it. You know, you may have an increased risk after 15 to 20 years, and even that's debatable. Um, but if you're taking estrogen plus progestin, you're probably going to have increased risk of um, breast cancer, which is in the rare category. And that risk seems to start years after starting it, so anywhere from three to five years. So if you want to try hormone therapy for a year or two just to see if you're going to get some quality of life benefits, that's reasonable. Where these, all these risks and benefits we're talking about are really with long-term use, okay? Um, and people worry about cardiovascular risks. That's one thing that's written in the package insert. Again, that's really for women in their 60s and 70s. It turns out, that, again, the timing hypothesis, if you're starting your hormone therapy when the blood vessels are healthier, um, you don't significantly increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. But there's some benefits, you know, the reduction in osteoporosis fractures. 
especially hip fractures, um, which you know not a lot of the fancier new medications haven't even been shown to help with benefit of hip fractures, um, and also decreased redu reduction in colon cancer risk in estrogen progestin users by 20%. Um, so it really is mixing the pros and the cons, and it really, just like anything else, is an individualized decision for each woman. Great, thank you. Now, how long can you safely stay on hormone therapy? So there's really no time limit for hormone therapy. Um, we do know that after uh, three, three to, around the three to five year mark, that's when you start to increase your risk of breast cancer. And when I said it was uh, in the rare category, I'd have to write about 1,000 prescriptions um, to, of the estrogen plus progestin to potentially increase one woman's risk. And that's to, uh, that risk is... Um, comparable to uh, other lifestyle changes. It's comparable to if you know if you have a few extra pounds to lose, that increases your risk of breast cancer. If you consume alcoholic beverages um, every week, um, that increases your risk of breast cancer. So it's actually comparable to that. Um, and what if um, a woman has a family history of breast cancer? What are her options? So a family history of breast So this is something that I really want to spend some time on um, because most women are coming in worried about risk of breast cancer, okay? Um, so if you have a very small family history, for example, you have a grandmother that had breast cancer at a later age, we're, I mean, yeah, we worry about any kind of family history, but the, um, that's a lower risk, and so I'm not as worried about the risks of hormones. Um, after breast cancer, we rarely use um, hormone therapy, so that's the other extreme where a woman's highest risk uh, because she's already had cancer before. Um, now, there are exceptions to that rule, too. There are certain situations where we do, um, especially if a woman has, ter one has terrible quality of life symptoms. But there's that in-between where there are women who have some family history or they carry the gene for the breast cancer, um, you know, the BRCA gene. Um, in those situations, we really individualize. For example, what we do know, um, we see a lot of patients who have, um, who carry the gene, the BRCA gene for um, breast and ovarian cancer, and many of these women opt to have their ovaries removed um, early. So now they are in premature menopause. So we know there's all the premenop premature menopause risks and you know she may be having terrible quality of life symptoms you know vaginal pain with intercourse not being able to sleep terrible hot flashes mood hair falling out um, so that this woman may decide that she's going to use hormone therapy and we're really working hard to streamline our program between us the breast center and our gynecologic oncology colleagues so that we're giving a consistent message. Because we do oftentimes, in these younger women, use hormone therapy. And the studies that we do have suggest that in our patients, even at the highest risk who carry this gene, um, do not seem to get increased risk from hormone therapy or even con oral contraceptives. Um, which are higher dose. So it's important to really individualize, and we want to make sure that we're not making women suffer with you know, dogmatic rules, and that we are really weighing the risks and the benefits for the individual woman sitting in front of us. Yeah. Very good, thank you for that. So after researching and talking to people, it seems like there's a lot of confusion with hormone therapy. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, you know, um, Everybody means, well, you're going to get a lot of advice from hormone therapy, but you go to, even if you come to somebody certified in menopausal medicine like us, we sit and have an hour session, you're going to go back home and a well-intentioned doctor, a uh, friend, a well-intentioned neighbor is going to say, oh my gosh, you know, hormone therapy, haven't you heard that stuff is so dangerous? So there are a few things that we really, sh I do like to highlight. Um, hormone therapy consistently in studies has been associated with a decreased risk of dying. You know, so we talk about a lot of risks of this and a little risk of that and this benefit, but in the big picture, I mean, we want to live a long, healthy life, right? Um, so we talk a lot about the breast cancer risk, but we know that if women, the breast cancer, in, uh, the r increased risk of breast cancer comes with a, a more easy to treat breast cancers. But consistent, there are not many medications in history that have actually consistently been shown to decrease risk of death. And hormone therapy is actually one of them. So women, are, in fact, there was increased death rate throughout the nation and mortality, as we say, in women um, after the release of controversial hormone, hormone therapy risks and benefits where many women came off. You saw, started to see an increase in the death rate of women as opposed to a drop in the death rate in men. And the only main difference at that time was that there was actually this huge stopping of hormone therapy. 
but we do know cardiovascular risks are um, increased immediately you know, when women uh, in the time period immediately after stopping hormone therapy. So it's really quite com hormone therapy is quite complex. You do need to talk about your individual risk versus benefits with somebody who really knows the data because it's not as simple as what the package insert makes it sound to be. And um, this question comes up with everything. Hormones, do they cause weight gain? Yeah, so weight, uh, hormones and weight, uh, again, weight gain seems to be universal throughout the menopause transition and, and into menopause. And so the data that we have so far doesn't suggest the hormones cause any uh, weight gain. In fact, if anything, um, if you look at populations of women, women on hormone therapy seem to gain less weight than women who try to struggle through menopausal symptoms on their own. So since menopause is a natural change for a woman, when or why should I see a doctor? Well, um, you should see your doctor when you're going through menopause because you should make sure that there's no other... Uh, other reasons why you may have stopped having your periods, such as a thyroid problem. Plus, you know, if you're the average age, 51, 52, that's a time of change where now the cholesterol may, uh, you're, you're starting to lose some of the protective benefits of the estrogen. So you're starting to increase your cardiovascular risk. The cholesterol isn't looking as good. So your doctor wants to talk to you about other preventative things. Now, if you are younger and you're going through menopause, you definitely need to seek you know, guidance from your physician um, because we need to explore a little further, make sure your medical health is okay, make sure we're not missing other reasons, and to talk about the pros and cons of hormone therapy specifically. All right, one last question for mm -hmm. you. What is the best way to maintain a healthy lifestyle after menopause? I just wanna hear your recommendation to our audience. Yeah, I mean, the tried and true things that you hear everybody preaching really do make the biggest difference. I mean, getting your regular aerobic exercise, uh, minimizing your intake, to, intake of processed foods, um, minimizing carbs, I think, is important to bring down insulin levels with our typical American way of life, especially um, after menopause. Not smoking, making sure your blood pressures, because it's really the making your blood pressure, making sure your blood pressure is good, that you know your cholesterol numbers, because really, in the end, you know, watching these risk factors is gonna help you minimize cardiovascular risks. Um, you do wanna make sure that, you know, if you're in menopause and you're opting to not take hormone therapy that your doctor is assessing your um, vaginal symptoms. So in case you're, you know, having pain or intercourse, sometimes urinary symptoms uh, can be accompanied with the lack of estrogen and also following your bone health to make sure that, you know, osteopenia, osteoporosis is being prevented. There is one thing that I, I always try to tell my patients, um, if you really have to be an advocate for your health, when I look at, listen to people who have been frustrated with their health care thus far, um, or if you feel like they got blown off or misdiagnosed, I always almost hear an element of broken down communication between the doctor, the health care provider, and um, the patient. So if you're going to see your doctor and you, or your you know, nurse practitioner or your physician assistant, and um, you're bringing up something at the annual, it, they may want you to come back, but bring it up, you know, speak up, say, you know, I'm having pain with intercourse, you know, I, my hot flashes are terrible, my mood, my mood stinks. They may not be able to address it as part of a preventive, but they may ask you to come back, bring it up. And then keep in mind also that if you're not feeling better, if we don't hear back from you, we assume you're feeling great, okay? And I think this is where a lot of people get disgruntled with the medical community, because when you come into the office, you talk to me about something, I have a plan A, B, and C in my mind. But typically, I'm going through plan A, because it's either simpler for you or cheaper or most likely to help you. But if you never reach out to me saying, hey, this is not working for me, I never get an opportunity to talk about plan B or plan C or do more investigating to make sure you're not that one in 100 that's presenting differently. Um, so what I see a lot is people get disgruntled and they say, oh, you know, that doctor just set, recommended this. Let me go try somebody else. Let me go. And they're seeing three different people, four different people, and they're all starting with plan A. So I think this is being your own advocate, speaking up, and recognizing that, you know, your doctor may want to see you back to talk more, and that's okay. Um, but take those next steps. I love that. That's a very good point because sometimes you go to the doctor and you're like, she knows what to ask me. I'll tell her when she asks. And sometimes you just keep your things inside. But mm -hmm. that's a very, very good point. 
And I appreciate your time today, Dr. Victoria. Yes, it's been a absolutely. Speaking with you. Thank you so much. And to schedule an appointment with a woman's health specialist, please call 216 444 6601. And to listen to more of our Health Essentials podcast, you can go to clevelandclinic.org slash HE podcast. And for the latest Cleveland Clinic news and health tips, make sure you're following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Cleveland Clinic, just one word. Thank you. We'll see you again soon.